Hello and welcome to this lesson about creative writing for GCSE English Language Paper 1, Section B, The Writing Task. Um, and we're going to be looking at how you can use the journey structure in order to create a really well structured piece of writing. Structure is often one of the things that students really forget about doing. Um, and if you make that your starting point and you've got a very definite plan before you start writing, your writing is much more likely to be very successful. So for this lesson, um, we're going to be working with um, some writing by Miriam Darlington, who is a lecturer in creative writing at Plymouth University, as well as being a published author. You can see her two books there, Owl Sense and Otter Country, as well as um, writing in the Times newspaper in the Nature Notebook section um, regularly. So I'd like you to begin by thinking about the journey such structure. This might be something you've used before. Um, and if it is, what can you remember about how to use this structure? One might be something that you're coming across for the first time. And again, if it is, um, using the picture on the uh, left hand side to help you, um, how do you think this might work in a piece of writing? Why do you think that this might be a good technique to use, especially for a timed piece of descriptive writing in an exam setting? And finally, why would this structure create an enjoyable piece of writing for the reader? Because remember, if you can get the examiner to really enjoy the piece of writing that you've produced, um, I know this myself because I'm an examiner, I'm more likely to go, you know, really hunting for marks to give you if I've, if I've had an emotional response to your piece of writing. And although our focus today is structure, uh, we mustn't forget about um, the quality of our writing as well. So have a look at the opening of Miriam's uh, piece of writing from the Times Nature Notebook and just see if you can jot down, if you can print it off and annotate it, that would be great. Um, how has Miriam used language in order to make her writing engaging in this first section? It had been one of those long nights the moon was too bright as it shone through the open curtains. Not a breath of cool came through the window. I threw off the stifling duvet and stepped outside onto the balcony, hoping for some breeze. In the gloom, there was no sound. Just a few lights dotted here and there from the town. As, gray, as, ugh, as a grey dawn drifted in, the bird song became too loud to ignore. There would be no sleep. Blackbirds battled and the wood pigeon wouldn't be quiet and the magpies, well, the less said about their racket, the better. They've set up a guerrilla war with the jackdaws on next door's roof and what with the nesting gulls and the poor collared doves, some mornings it never ends. Finally, I pulled on my shoes to go for, to a quieter oasis. If only we all had green lanes to go to. In Devon, these buzzing thorny perfume tunnels are at their peak right now. This one is never the same two days in a row. So see if you can identify a range of language uh, devices that the writers used and have a think about sentence variety as well. So some of the things that I picked out are, first of all, are um, the phonological devices in the writing. There's some lovely alliteration going on in the, there. Uh, dawn drifted and the blackbirds battled. Those lovely plosive sounds of blackbirds and battling really kind of picking out the noisy uh, uh, sounds the birds are making that have disturbed her sleep. We've also got, um, in contrast to that, a nice kind of soft assonance. One of those long nights, the moon was too bright. So that lovely um, focus on the vowel sounds there. Um, lots of imagery. It's, it's so beautiful and rich in imagery, isn't there? Just in the first paragraph, uh, we've got the visual imagery. The moon was too bright as it shone through the curtains and blending that with kinesthetic imagery, not a breath of cool. Uh, the language choices are very precise, so uh, the adjective used for the duvet, the stifling duvet, is really well chosen adjective there to um, emphasise the, you know, the restlessness and the discomfort of a hot, sticky summer's night. Um, going back to the birds again, you've got um, a bit of personification beginning to creak creep in haven't you uh, they've set up a guerrilla war as if the birds had you know human qualities and were actively at war with each other 
Um, and um, again, talking about adjectives, the pattern of three at the bottom, buzzing, thorny, perfumed, tunnel. So again, really well chosen vocabulary, but in that, that lovely long pattern of three. Um, there are short sentences for effect. There would be no sleep. Um, and it creates a nice rhythm in amongst those longer sentences. So those are just some of the things that she's used in her writing that you can think about using in yours as well. I'd also like you to think really carefully about your vocabulary choices as well. This is something that as an examiner, I often really struggle to give marks for when I'm um, marking a piece of work. On the left hand side, you can see a list of words that appear later on in the piece of writing. Um, so I'm going to challenge you to try and include some of those. If you know what they mean, brilliant. If you don't, do a bit of investigation. But you could also extend and develop this vocabulary bank by thinking about synonyms and antonyms. And I've given you an example down there. Uh, the word slender appears in the text, but just by you know right clicking on um, that word, my computer opens up the synonyms bank so I can start thinking about slender. I could also use slim or willowy. You could also use an old fashioned paper thesaurus if you've got one at home. Um, but then if I just think of the, the most simple antonym to slender, I came up with thick. Um, and again, going on that exploratory journey, what other words could I use for, for the word thick? I've got dense, bulbous and copious. So, you know, I'd be a very happy examiner if the word copious and bulbous appeared in a piece of writing that I was marking. So we've got contours, sinuous, slender, precariously, spires, vivid, speckled, plunging, bristling, saffron, mesmerised, tentative, ragged, charisma, unsung, iridescent and enlivened. Good luck with those. OK, using those first three paragraphs as a starting point, then we've got to the point where the narrator, the writer is pulling on their shoes and heading for this green lane to escape the, the noise of a sleepless morning. How would you continue with this piece of writing? Can you draw on your own memories of walking somewhere similar? Um, can you quickly, you know, do a Google of, of Devon Green Lanes and see what you can see? I've added some photographs on this slide as well, so that might inspire you a little bit. Remember, we're doing the journey structure, so you literally, you know, you could draw a kind of a, a wiggly line and at certain points put a cross on the paper where you stop and you notice and you observe. Um, what would your route be? Uh, is it a circular structure? Do you come back home? Do you walk towards a particular landmark or a particular point? Um, do you stay in the, the lane the whole time or does it open up at, at certain points into a field or do you end up on the, you know, on the, the coast or something like that? Can you um, draw on your journey four or five interesting features that um, you want to draw the um, reader's attention to at certain points of your journey and how will your piece of writing reach a nice structured ending? Okay, so you should be ready to write now. Um, I've included on the left hand side here um, the success criteria, some of the points we've already covered. So by taking the time to do that planning, you should quite comfortably be in the green for those. We've talked about varied vocabulary. We've talked about language choices. We've talked about structure and paragraphing. Because you've taken the time to plan, you should therefore be quite comfortable with developing those ideas. So it's down to you to just keep an eye on varying your sentence types. Remember, I know it's a little little bit artificial but try and demonstrate that you can use the full range of punctuation if you can um, and the accuracy so the spelling and the accuracy of punctuation and if you want to look in a bit more detail I've included the mark scheme for level three there remember it's marked out of four levels level three depending on the grade boundaries would be getting you something like a grade six or a grade seven so don't worry about setting yourself any time limits for this, but remember that the exam board like two-ish sides. So if you can continue, um, whether you're typing or handwriting, uh, to produce the equivalent of about two-ish sides in your handwritten um, size of writing. Hello, my name's Miriam Darlington and I write the Times Nature Notebook on Saturdays every month. 
Here's the nature notebook that I wrote in June. It had been one of those long nights. The moon was too bright as it shone through the open curtains. Not a breath of cool came through the window. I threw off the stifling duvet and stepped out onto the balcony, hoping for some breeze. In the gloom there was no sound, just a few lights dotted here and there from the town. As a grey dawn drifted in, the birdsong became too loud to ignore. There would be no sleep. Blackbirds battled, the wood pigeons wouldn't, wood pigeons wouldn't be quiet, and the magpies, well, the less said about their racket, the better. They've set up a guerrilla war with the jackdaws or next door's roof, and what with the nesting gulls and the poor collared doves, some mornings it never ends. Finally, I pulled on my shoes to go to a quieter oasis. If only we all had a green lane to go to. In Devon, these buzzing, thorny, perfumed tunnels are at their peak right now. This one is never the same two days in a row. Although the dusty contours of the track have been baked dry as concrete by the sun, as you make your way inward and down, the sinuous hazel shaded depths of this cool, dreamy place always lead the eye to something new. Twisting away from the farm near my house, down into the most hidden valley I know, the only sound in this lane was skylarks chipping away at higher notes, the tuneful twitter of goldfinches and the resonant melodies of warblers backed by the trickle of the stream that flows down to the river Dart. People sometimes come down here on bikes, but you miss everything on a bike. A slower pace was needed, especially as now is the time of the foxgloves. Rosy purple, precariously leaning, the slender spires were heavy with vivid colour, their softly speckled sockets hiding a deadly beauty. If the towering forest of bell-shaped blooms took my breath away, the bees were mad for them immune to the poison, plunging in then emerging, legs a wriggle, backs bristling with pollen. My mood lifted, bee by bee. I've trouble identifying solitary bees, but who cares for as long as their orange or saffron or pearly furred bottoms disappeared into the tubular depths of the foxgloves, I was mesmerised. Waiting for the bees to re-emerge, the earth smelled like incense. The old bluebells, newly hatched dog rose and moist honeysuckle all mingled to create an intoxication I suppose some people would pay plenty for. Don't be fooled though, digitalis purpurea from the Latin finger-like, the common foxglove is highly toxic if ingested. On the other hand, not to be tried at home. Its leaves are used in medicine following the diagnosis of heart failure as it can increase blood flow and slow and strengthen the heartbeat. Returning from the green lane, the sky darkened and a few drops of rain began to patter around me. The tentative sound was balm, like a massage for the inner ear, and the thirsty hedges and gardens, the dusty windscreens and cracking pavements all sucked up the brief shower, sending out the scent of moistened pavement, damp petals and wet grass. My heart skipped a beat when a flying scarlet thing zipped past my nose and settled, joining in with another on the ragged indigo of the greater knapweed flowers in my garden. As the two insects joined together, I recognised them as the startlingly beautiful scarlet tiger moth. This day flying moth is relatively common in the southwest and inhabits damp places like the corners of gardens. You have to see one to fully appreciate its charisma. We think of butterflies as the star insects, but moths often win the beauty contest for me. With their subtle coloration and understated patterning, they are also the unsung pollinators of our gardens. They perform a large proportion of the pollination of our fruit and vegetables while we sleep. Scarlet tigers are attracted to comfrey, scabious, knapweed, which is perhaps why I found it close to the widening tumble of wildflowers I've been encouraging around my veg patch. The scarlet tiger lives up to its dramatic name. At rest, its stylish black forewings have a green sheen and its head and feelers are tinged with iridescent blue. Its upper wings are decorated with symmetrical saffron yellow and cream spots. And when the wings are fully open, the striking dazzle of the scarlet and black spotted hind wing is revealed like a showy petticoat. It's the small things right now, isn't it? These two are as glistening as catwalk models, 
and seemed as enlivened by the rain as I was grateful for it. If the technology is going to be on my side today, on the next slide, you should um, hear Miriam reading the complete piece that appeared in the, the Times Nature Notebook. I hope you really enjoy it. So the final thing I'd like you to do, and if you could include these in any written responses you send to me, I'd like you to think about the final questions here then. So what was enjoyable about using the journey structure in your writing? Did this piece of writing alter your mood? How did you feel after completing it? Why is having a connection with the natural world important? And why is nature writing important, especially during our lockdown? So really look forward to you sending me what you've produced then. Have a good day. Bye.